Good morning, everybody. I am going to click to comments so I can see your comments on the screen. Hopefully you can see me. Uh, my name is Vanessa Fox O'Loughlin um, and Sam Blake, as you can see on the screen there. And um, I run writing.ie and we are delighted to be back uh, today, Friday at lunchtime uh, for the what writing game, winning the writing game uh, with Simon Chewin and this this week, uh, the amazing Simon Scarrow. So two Simons for you. Um, Simon Scarrow is the multi-million best-selling author of a host of books set predominantly during the Roman era, um, but also he's written about Napoleon and the Duke of Wellington and um, covered different areas um, in history. And significantly, that for me, that means that not only has he the challenge of creating an incredible plot, um, but also a believable world, um, and he's an absolute master of that, um, as we're going to find out. Now, his latest book is called Blackout, and it is uh, set in Berlin in 1939. When a young woman is murdered, criminal inspector Horst Schenker is under pressure to solve the case. Today, uh, Simon Truin is our question master, and I am going to bring the two Simons in now, um, and I'm seeing a great gang of you joining. That's, that's lovely. Hi, Mark is in York there. Um, I'll bring the two gentlemen in now. So, Mr. Truin, bring you Good in morning. first. This is Good Simon, morning. Simon number two. I, I know my yes. play. This and is there is Mr. One. Scarrow. Hello, Let Simon. me vanish <laughs> and I will leave you to it. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Simon, thank you very much for joining us. We, um, we've been doing this for, I don't know, about 18 months now. And I think um, I love talking to writers and I love discovering what really goes on in their minds and in their offices and in their desks and whenever they're out walking and <laughs> thinking about process. But um, it seems to me right, we've got about a thousand years of history to cover in the next hour. Uh, we're going oh, to go to a thousand. Okay. Only a thousand. Okay. We're going to go to the Roman Empire. We're going to go to. Um, we're going to go to the siege of Malta. Possibly. We're going to definitely go to 1939 uh, Berlin. But I just wanted to start with you and to say when you were um, when you were young and reading, because all writers are born out of the books they read. What, mm. what were you reading? What were you under the bed covers with for the torch at night? Um, well, I mean, I, I, you know, I had the usual thing thrust on, on me by parents when I was young, which was Ina Blyton. So I think yeah. every, you know, quite a lot of people start with Famous Five and Secret Seven. Mm. And of course, that, that, that makes you want to go out and start your own gang. But not, not all of us get to live near Curran Island and, you know, so we have to make do with the neighbourhood we've got. Um, so the, it was that. But then the, the big change actually came when my father gave me a copy of um, The Happy Return by C.S. Forrester which was the first book that he wrote in the Hornblower cycle, even right. though you know, what he had to do then was go back and write some earlier stuff mm. and then fit the whole career around that. But still, for my money, the best of the series. Um, and that I thought, wow, this is amazing. So I started that, and that, that really got me launched into historical fiction in a big way. And um, the key thing, I think, um, after that was coming across um, Lindsay Davis's Falco novels, Right, because I had been um, after this was after I graduated, and I, and I, I was at that stage I wanted to be a writer, but uh, you know I was doing the, the the usual kind of Tyro's mistake of um, trying to see what was popular and aping that. And yeah. um, what I really wanted to read was um, a kind of Hornblower series um, set in in Rome, because you know uh, Lindsay Davis proved that Lynn, you know that uh, there was a market in in Rome yeah. production. Um, but nobody at that stage had kind of hornblowerized it. Um, mm. It was mostly kind of generals, emperors, this sort of thing, and very little attention on the, on the worm's eye view of ancient yep. Rome. And I think her channeling Raymond Chandler, you know, through the sort of um, Falco, I thought was a stroke of genius. And I thought, well, you know, you can look at, you can write about the Roman Empire from the ground up. And uh, and I'd always been interested in the, in the Roman military. Um, so I yeah. thought, well, you know, let's do the Squaddies version of of of, uh, of the Roman Empire. So um, I need to ask you, who who was your history teacher at school? Because clearly they got a lot uh, a lot to be thanked for. <laughs> well, that's a lovely story, actually. I, I had a um, uh, a post on Facebook the other day um, from somebody saying, "Oh, didn't my dad used to teach you history at school?" Mm. And, I, and this, this guy's name was Mills. And I thought, oh, you mean John Mills? And he went, yeah, 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 that's my dad, Jonathan Mills. 
my history teacher. And I was kind of like, you know, one of those moments of starstruck awe, you know, because he yeah. had that kind of stature when I was uh, doing history at school. And he was by far and away the most um, impressive teacher because he understood. I mean, there were two phases to it. There was the pre-A-level phase where yeah. um, he rightly understood that if you're going to interest, you know, interest kids in, in history, you do it as a soap opera. So yeah. he would get to a certain point in a lesson and say, and Henry VIII could have married Catherine of Aragon, or we shall find <laughs> out in the next lesson. So, of course, we would pile in there to make sure that, we, you know, we, we were first through the door to find out what happened next yeah. lesson. And then he, there was a gear change, obviously, when we got to A-level. And at the time, the Cambridge uh, board was doing an experiment. So we had a Roman history module, which worked out mm. very well. Yeah, right. um, and then there was a, a personal, there was a, a private kind of history research uh, project that you could do as well. And my uh, grandfather was um, very interesting, weird bloke. Actually, he was a communist. He was a not that communism being a weird thing, but you know, mm. when you compare it to you know, com bundle up with that the fact that he was anti-Semitic and a Freemason, um, then it, it doesn't kind of all stick together terribly well. <laughs> but he was one of the okay. organizers of the general strike. And um, so I had a, a conversation with him, and he knew the leaders of the NUR at Aslef because he was uh, at the started his career at the Bishopsgate Depot in London and fought the troops in the streets during the general right. strike. Okay. So um, that gave me an opportunity to do some real historical kind of research, not just reading out of books, you know, consulting archives, interviewing people. Um, and uh, John Mills was, you know, behind that, and uh, you know. A really, really huge influence on me um, in terms of getting excited, getting passionate about history. And did um, I see we've got the book jacket up? Did um, did um, did Mr. Mills um, live long enough to see you have success as a writer? Well, he's he's alive now because um, right. uh, when I spoke to this guy, um, he said, uh, "Yeah, you know, he's retired now. He lives up in um, I think it's uh, in the north." And he said, "So I've got his uh, address. I've just sent him off a couple of books, actually, in a letter, oh, just to just to thank him because you know he's made, oh. made a huge difference to my life. You know, teachers can, yeah. um, and you know that's one of the big joys I had out of teaching when I did it was this 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 opportunity to help people, you know." <laughs> be passionate about something really so what kind, what kind of teacher were you quite intolerant actually i i I, I, you know, <laughs> I i wanted to i was always very very optimistic for my uh, students um you mm. know we uh, you know case in point we had a guy come down from the department for education when they introduced target setting and he right. said to me um so what is your uh uh, target going to be for the pass rate for the students this year and i said well it's the same as every year i would like 100 percent of them to pass said, yeah. no 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 mr scarrow we can't be doing with any of that how can we have show that you're progressing if unless we start from a low base and so we spent the afternoon haggling and came to some farcical figure i think it was 84 percent so it's an absorption basically yeah, yeah I mean, absolutely guys. stupid so um and you know and i think that you know you need to be uh really positive for your kids. You need to be kind of constantly pushing them and saying, look, you can achieve all this stuff. You can be, you know, ambitious for yourself and 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 for the things that you're passionate about. But one oh, of the yeah. things I find, you know, really disturbing, having gone around a lot of schools in England talking um, to students, you, if you go to a private school, you hear teachers talking to their students. And, and, my, and my son went to um, the Norwich School. Yeah. And I remember being horrified listening to the head teacher saying, to the, in an assembly, you are the elite, you are the best in society, mm. um, and creating this enormous sense of entitlement. And, you know, so you've got that happening to those students. Mm. And then I would find myself going to comprehensive schools, and they'd be saying things like, um, well, of course, we do the best we can for the poor dears, but it's damage limitation, yada, yada. And you think, mm. how dare you? Yeah, you know, yeah. How, how, how dare you set their aspirations so low? Um, and this is why, you know, you, you have the problems you do. So I think uh, from a teaching point of view, my, I was always very, very pushy, you know, make them push them, make them so they learn stuff. So even, even at A level, I was making sure I introduced them to as much critical theory as possible very yeah. early on. Um, so that we didn't get any kind of, you know, the embarrassing silences when they were a bit worried about uh, looking like a fool in front of their mates. 
um, you know, because they were armed with that sort of stuff. And, and quite frequently, I'd get, I'd get emails from them when they're at university saying, well, we've basically done the first year, you know, because we did all of this stuff at A level. And if you can give people that confidence early on in a subject, you know, sky's the limit. Wonderful. So uh, at what stage did you um, did you start to write? I mean, I'm not, I mean, what time did you start to write as an author where the ambition was to get published? Um, after I graduated, um, because oh. I was, you know, I'm still one of those people that doesn't know what they're going to do when they grow up. Um, <laughs> you know, the writing is a hobby. Yeah, yeah uh, of I actually worked out what I want to be. Yeah. So, um, you know, after I graduated, I, I had no idea. I'd thought about joining the army, um, but this was about the time of the Falklands War. And I thought, well, you know, this is largely a, a struggle over the nationality of mutton. And, um, you know, I wasn't really yeah. keen to sacrifice my life for something so farcical, to be honest. Um, mm. uh, I know that's not a popular thing, to, you know, these flag shagging days that we live in. Um, but that's how I felt about it at the time. And, um, you know, I didn't know. I tried. My father was uh, a banker and he introduced me to a lot of people and you'd go there and these people you know, sitting in front of screens and you're thinking, ironically, of course, now I'm a writer, I sit in front of the screen. But, you know, they're sitting there doing all these kind of share transaction and currency transactions and it looked pretty boring, to be honest. Mm. So um, I, in the end, it was just a sheer act of desperation. I, I joined the civil service and I only joined the uh, Inland Revenue because I knew it pissed my dad off. I mean, you know, that's kind of how undirected I was. And at the same time, I thought, well, actually, what I really want to be, if anything, is a, is a writer. But, you know, the odds are stacked against you. As you know, it's a lottery. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, know, you can be the best writer in the world, and unless the right, you know, ducks line up, you're not, you're not going to get anywhere. And conversely, you can be really, really crap. And, um, you know, you hit a certain uh, a moment in history and things line up, and you, and you can be a multi-billion bestseller. So um, I knew the odds were against me, and uh, you know, I, I, but I wanted to be a writer. So as I said, my initial tactic was to try and write stuff that I thought was selling well in shops. And I think what I learned is that you know, when I had a success, it was basically when I wrote what I wanted to read. You know, okay. yeah, yeah, and that was the key thing that changed. Um, and I thought, well, I'll write this for me. And I'll trust that if I write it in an interesting enough way, somebody else will be interested. I think if you take a kind of hard-hearted, cynical, uh, you know, approach when you say, right, well, you know, Fifty Shades of Grey is doing well, so I'm going to do better on the Sixty Shades of Blue, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, then, you, you know, everybody's doing that anyway. You know, and how are you going to stand out from the herd? If this is your attempt to break into publishing, it's probably not the best way to do it. You've got to believe in what you're doing. Totally. Um so can you describe the moment where you got your first manuscript accepted or you got an agent or the agent? Yeah, yeah. That, I, um, that, was, that, that was interesting because I, I, I kind of knew what I wanted to do. So I'd uh, worked it out as an outline, wrote the first three chapters, sent it off to an agent. I sent it off to quite a lot of agents. Uh, one yeah. came back and said, uh, yeah, it's great. Where's the rest of the book? And I had to sort of say, well, actually, you know, it's, it's still in the pen. Yes. Um, uh, so they gave me a, a year to sort of come up with the goods, and then we edited it because it's about 140,000 words. And, and Wendy Suffield said, "No, I can't submit this until you, know, you get it down to about 100,000 words." Okay. So that was a real education editing because I, you know, 40,000 words I'd sweated over had to go, right. and it, and it was a real liberation to go through it, taking material out and feeling, mm -hmm. you know, yeah confident about that and then at seeing at the end of the day that it was a much leaner um more gripping uh, plot that you could come up with so um that that was a real education and then um she submitted it to four publishers um uh who were interested but yeah. um one of them said oh that's great but could you turn it into a detective novel i know <laughs> and um a headline were the ones that came through and uh and it was lovely actually because i was teaching that morning and i had a, a message in my pigeonhole saying um could you call your agent so I, day, doesn't it? yeah yeah loudest whoop ever in the staff room as you can imagine uh when that came through and um for months i couldn't actually um cash the initial check because i just it was there on the mantelpiece you know yeah because it finally it had happened 
And um, you know, that, that's how the whole thing started. It's, it's a wonderful moment, uh, that first breakthrough, actually. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of writers I've spoken to, they say, you know, you write your first book kind of for yourself and, mm. and you hope that something's going to happen. But then when you cash that check, something happens, you're kind of, it's a, it is literally a contract, isn't it? Mm. Some people it's a Faustian pact, other people it's kind of liberating. And I think, I think Douglas Adams at one point had terrible writer's block because he'd, he'd worked out that every word he was going to write for this sequel to Hitchhikers was, someone was going to pay him like, you know, $180 per word and he'd write a kind of, sentence and think how can that be worth a thousand dollars and then he delete it and i mm. think you know, and i don't know did you did you find writing your second book a very different experience knowing it knowing it was going to be published yeah uh, absolutely um you know the second book is always the toughest book um in any series i think it, uh, particularly if, if the first one's gone well um yeah you know if you're building a career and you know there are modest for sales and, blah, 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 and then uh, i think that's that's possibly um slightly less of a challenge, but if you, the first one's gone down well, and then you've got to repeat it and do yeah. better, you know, that, that's the real challenge. And, and it was a bit of a nightmare writing that second book. <laughs> um, and I'm, you know, I'm, in a way, I'm, I'm kind of mentally bracing myself to write the second of the, uh, the Blackout books. Um, yeah. Because that's going to be a challenge, you know, to, to get it up to the level of the first one. Um, so well, that, I've got plenty of plots, you know. I'm, I'm, right, yeah, there's no shortage of plots in Berlin, is there? I mean, yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think the 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 first time I went to Berlin was in 1981, and most recent times about four years ago. And I and I always kind of feel walking through Berlin, particularly now, I, I feel like it's it's like walking through a history exam that I haven't quite done the right revision for because it's a it's a hugely complex and layered city, isn't it? In terms yeah. of you're it's a fabulous. Wall. It's yeah. a fabulous city um, in in so many respects. I mean, you know, the food's great. People are really nice. Yeah. It's laid back. Yeah. Um, but then there's that that sort of amazing, as you say, um, layering of history across it. Yeah. So you have the the ancient uh, history museum with the reconstructed Pergamon gates yes. from uh, Babylon, and yeah. that that's you know that blows you away when you see that. Um, and then there's the you know. One thing I really like about Germans is their attitude to history. Um, so there's a history of German, the German people, I think it's called, and they don't shy away from the fact that you know the Nazi era, and they, and they you know, pointedly make you know uh, uh, the representations of this material as in, look, you know, this is a warning. History is is a warning. We need to sort of yeah. understand this in, in order yeah. to progress. Whereas in Britain, it seems to be very much the case of. You know, we keep pushing towards this version of history, which is some sort of nostalgic celebration of a mythological Britain that never was, you know. Um, yeah. So that's, oh, the empire, you know. And then well, you've got the, those. Uh, but any teaching of history has to yeah. start with Winston Churchill. And you're thinking, mm -hmm. why? You know, we and, and, and this is, I think, that is that kind of thing that drove um, a lot of the, the support for Brexit was this nostalgic waving of flags and, oh, um, yeah. you know, we can be great again, with, you know, on our own and all this sort of stuff. And you think, yeah. well, the world's moved on and this yeah. is what the Germans get that we don't, you know. Yeah. I mean, the fact we still have something called the Imperial War Museum. Mm, mm. And, and as you say, it's that kind of keep calm and carry on and kind of mythologized, you know, the Queen Mum going to the East End and all that kind of stuff, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I think um, you know history's fun. History's good. History's where all the good stories are. But at the same time, it's a discipline. You know, it's a teacher. It's a kind of a record of things we got wrong as well as got right. Yeah. And and, and as a as a reservoir for that kind of uh, knowledge, it should generate wisdom. But so frequently it doesn't. You know, it, it generates the opposite of wisdom. It generates a sort of an ignorance of how we came to be where we are. And, I, and that's my sort of big worry about, um, you know, various governments' uh, attempts to tinker with the curriculum. Well, I mean, you're, I mean, I suppose that as a historian, I mean, you're coming to the, you're coming to Berlin in the blackout, which I, I should say, first of all, I, I, I thought it's, it's a fantastic book, and I, I was lucky enough to be sent one of these gorgeous proofs with the black sprayed yeah. edges and all of that. But I would. Uh, I hope a lot of people are going to order this during the next uh, 41 minutes. It's not going to disappoint. And I, I hadn't realized there were going to be more. So that's, that's very, very exciting. Um, you're coming to Berlin as a historian 
second and as a novelist first or the other way around? Because I think there's a, there's a um, different angle of entry, isn't there? I, you know, I, I, don't, I can't uh, disaggregate the two. I really can't. Um, because, you know, the moment you go into a place with your histor historian's head on, yeah. um, you're immediately kind of struck with the, the potential for story. Um, and equally, if, if you're, you're, you're thinking about a story and then you kind of read a bit of history, you think, well, my goodness, that thing I'm thinking about now happened then as well and then. So there are, you know, these, these kind of homologies through history, um, which, uh, you know, are very, very easy to generate narrative from. And of course, you know, history is a narrative in its own right. You know, there is no such yeah. thing as um, some sort of objective history of things out there. History is just the succession of different kind of narrative strains um, of interpretation of the past. That's all it is. You know, any kind of idea that there's a, a, an objective historical uh, record that, to which we can all agree is just nonsense. So um, you, you start with you start with Berlin, nineteen thirty nine, and something I didn't know anything about. So do, would you, would you like to tell uh, tell people watching this about um, the government imposing a blackout on Berlin? That's because it's a, it's a, it's yeah, a great uh, kind of metaphor, isn't it? Really, as well. Well, it is. It is. I mean, this is the thing. Um, originally, the idea for uh, blackout started from a, an idea for a novel I want to write that's set in Alderney, because it's it's the only place in on the British Islands in which the Germans established a concentration camp during the Second World War. And I thought, and it's a lovely setting. I mean, it, it is Curran Island, basically, going back to the... <laughs> seriously, right. if, if yeah. you, have you been there? No, I haven't. I haven't actually. No. Oh, you've got to go. When the, when the right. pandemic lifts and stuff, yeah. um, you know, it is the most incredible three and a half miles by one and a half miles of turf, I think, anywhere uh, I've ever been. Wow. Okay. And um, it, it's just so atmospheric. So I thought it would be a great place to set this novel. But then I thought, well, the uh, inspector that's going to be sent there has to have committed some sort of crime um, in order to be sent there because it was a place where people were sent as a punishment. Okay. And um, so I thought, well, okay, I'm going to have to res uh, do a bit of research on Berlin and yeah. the police and, and the situation. And the more I, I looked at that, I thought, well, you know, there are more stories before we get to the story that I want to tell. And yeah. um, in the course of this, uh, I thought, well, I'll, I'll go back to the beginning of the war. And what I didn't realize at the time was that this was one of the worst winters on record in 1940. Right. Plus, of course, you have the blackout. And this is the... Um, then they had this from the start. They also had rationing from the start. I mean, the Germans kind of went into the war, you know, very prepared for the for the long haul. Um, and the irony, of course, is that a lot of people um, in the civil population thought that the war was going to be over very, very quickly because right. once right. Poland was defeated, why would France and Britain want to continue a war? Poland was the cause de guerre. It's no longer yeah. exists. Yeah. Why continue the war? So they were fully expecting peace around Christmas or in the spring. Um, okay. So there's this kind of weird sense of unreality in Berlin at that time, um, heightened by these kind of abnormal conditions of blackout, where uh, as soon as um, you know, dusk settles over the landscape, suddenly there are no street lights. There's no um, cars and bicycles could have lamps, but only with those tiny little slits. Mm. Uh, they were having to paint the uh, curbstones in, in luminous paint and yeah, when yeah. paint. Yeah in order to kind of uh, get, you know, stop the accidents. And, and the death rate for uh, road accidents just shot up, you know, uh, very mm. early on, plus crime. And, of course, yeah, the blackout yeah. is an absolutely perfect uh, environment for uh, petty crimes, prostitution, rape, you know, all sorts yeah. of things. Yeah. So, um, it, 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 and then I read about a, a guy who actually did do the uh, sort of the s -bahn killer was somebody who was um, doing their stuff in about a year further down the line. But I thought, mm. well, you know, I use that as an inspiration, but I thought the more interesting time to kind of set this kind of uh, criminal investigation would be right at the start because of the backup, because of the winter, and because of that kind of sense of unreality about the war that people um, had at the time. And as the series pans out, of course, we're going to see that shift in, in conditions and attitudes and realisation about how the war is going as the backdrop to the, the investigations that uh, uh, Schenker will be involved in. I mean, I think I think a lot of a lot of writers who are setting out to write historical fiction, they almost get weighed down by the um, by the by the weight of their own research, don't they? And the needs for everything to be on display. But um, 
I think I think the most successful historical fiction, and I and I really felt this with Blackout, is I had total confidence in you being a reader and you as a writer. I kind of know that you know about you know the iceberg, you know what's below the surface, you know how it all works, and you're just showing us what you need to show us for that story. But um, is is that a challenge sometimes as a writer? Do you want to show off your research? No, absolutely not. Um, because I mean, it, that you may come across one thing that you think I absolutely must get that into the story somehow. Uh, yeah. A case in point would be uh, when I went to the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge, yeah. and there is a Roman army, a, a Roman Swiss Army penknife that they have in their in their exhibition, okay. and I was just completely blown away by this, and I thought. Well, clearly, it's it's a fairly expensive piece of kit, so it's the kind of thing that somebody like a Tribune or a, a Legate might have. So that's yeah. why Cable gets hold of one, just purely because it's it's just such a, a wonderful item. But I think, as far as the research goes, I mean, there's a lot of work that goes into the research. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think that you have to trust the reader. If you simply yeah. dump loads yeah. of information on them uh, to prove that you've done the research, and they can go, "Oh yeah, well, that's really really interesting." You know, you can take the Frederick Forsyth approach and talk about end user certificates for you know 10, 15 pages or whatever. And that's all very fascinating from a, you know, if you have an interest in those sorts of things, but it doesn't move the plot along. And I think yeah. the um, the key thing to do with research is to, you know, assume the reader knows exactly what you know. Yeah. So um, as you're writing it, if they don't, they can always go away and, re and research it. But what you can't do, I think, and, and this is the point at which it kind of breaks down the fourth wall or, you know, um, takes you out of that sense of um, escapism, is when you feel you're being lectured to. And, you know, there are some books I've read where I write as I respect, but you get to a certain stage where somebody is saying, did you know... Um, I'll mention the name, you know, Claudius, that in, in the, every other year in the, in the Roman yeah, Senate, they elect such and such. No, do they? And these are two Roman senators talking, you know, and yeah. you think it just doesn't work. So I think you have to kind of wear the research lightly, trust the reader to um, go along with you. And if they're unsure about something, they can always look it up themselves. If you have a character kind of bluntly explain it to them, then it's ex <laughs> it, it, it kind of pulls you out of the story and you think, oh, God, I'm back in the classroom. You know, yeah, uh, it's like those radio plays where the scene starts with one character saying to the other, just run me through that one more time. And I, and I just yeah. think at that point, it's, it's such lazy, <laughs> lazy storytelling, isn't it? I mean, you know, um, there's some brilliant stuff on Radio 4. Um, yeah, absolutely love it. Yeah, yeah. But equally, there's some stuff you think, oh no, you know, it just reads like um, the Six Form Drama Society have got together with the word processor. Yeah, yeah. Um, so with the sequel, and um, are you? Uh, I mean, you're planning what a quartet of books, a trilogy of books based in Berlin. What's the idea? Um, well, at the moment, uh, Headline have commissioned another three books. Um, wow. and, no, and I've got plots for about five or six um, quite nicely kind of worked out. Um, so we'll just have to see how it goes. I mean, you know, when I started with the Roman books, mm -hmm. I initially thought, well, I'll, I'll aim for writing 10 at the outset, you know, at the outside. And my agent said, um, you know, we'll be lucky, you know, just be thinking sort of lucky if you get to sort of six or seven or eight. Yeah. And the publisher was thinking four or five in the series. And, of course, now I'm yeah. writing the twenty. Um, and uh, loving every you know, every time I get round to writing a macro and cater book, it's like going on holiday with mates. Are so, you um, are you a good student of your own books? I mean, I imagine when you when you get to that kind of world building of that level where you've written twenty books, mm. um, you're opening yourself up to the to the super fan writing in saying, "Well, actually, I I think you're wrong because in in book two, he did, you know, he always did the first shoelace up on, with his left hand, and you're like, yeah, ah. yeah. Well, it, it happens, um, you know, not as often as you know you'd think, and I'm glad no. about that. But um, I, I really should at some point sit down and write a database and you know get these this sort All of right. things. I suspect someone's already done it for you. I think the, the, the well, level uh, of so fandom they, out there. Has, you know, you get a free book for life if you can sort that one out for me. <laughs> but. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, but you know you tend to carry a lot of this stuff around in your head anyway, and my, yeah. uh, I'm getting on a bit, but the memory still works. So. Well, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, I mean, we've talked a lot to writers over the last year or two about um, writing series, um, and clearly you're not intimidated by the idea of you know 
your ambition was to write 10 books, you've now written 20. There's no sense of you ever running out of material, is there? No, well, yeah, eventually, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, but uh, for the moment, no, because um, we've got plenty of events coming up in, in, in yeah. the Roman history, in this, in this sort of setting to which Macro and Cato live, um, which can generate plenty more novels. And the key thing is keeping them alive, and uh, they're getting quite scarred and, and creaky. Um, but uh, the reality is that, you know, Macro's in his mid to late 40s, and he could carry on quite, quite a while yet. I know some quite fit people in their 50s, so, yeah. so that could happen. Um, but yeah. I, I think part of it as well is you, you keep it moving around the empire because, and people have said, well, is this realistic? Would they have served in all these places? And the answer is yes. I and mean, you can see this on tombstones. If you right. look at right. some of the ones that have been dug up in Britain, they will list sort of service in Syria, Egypt, Gaul, before they came to Britain. So it's perfectly credible. Um, and given that that's the case, there's no reason why Macro and Cato can't go on for quite a few more books yet. Um, I'm getting to the stage now where I'm actually feeling quite ambitious about writing the longest ever historical fiction series. Who do you have to beat? Well, I, you know, Sharp's up there, obviously. Um, yeah. And um, I think uh, Douglas Riemann yeah. wrote, a, wrote a series of novels under the name Alexander Kent. Bolivar That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I think he got up to 30 or something. Okay. So, um, yeah. I've got o a Where does Patrick O'Brien fit into that? 19. So I'm, I'm ahead of Patrick O'Brien. So... Um, but wow. uh, I've just got to do a couple more to uh, get ahead of Lindsay Davis's Falco series. But now she's shifted into doing uh, The Next Generation under, uh, I think it's Claudia Alba. Um, yeah. So she's written about eight books there. So it's the same kind of thing. But it's, 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 so it's going to be a while before I catch up with Lindsay. But you will do, and then you can be in the Guinness Book of Records as well, which is obviously a great, a great schoolboy kind of wish, isn't it? Um, <laughs> So in your in your in your Berlin series, are you going to be going up to kind of you know the nineteen fifties, or are you going to be sticking within uh, within the Second War? No, the, the 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 my in my head at the moment, the the, the time frame for the series is thirty nine to forty five, okay. possibly no, and possibly into forty six, um, because I think the um, I'm a big fan of the Third Man, and I think there's a lot oh, of yeah. you know material that you can work with in a in a, in a society that's completely devastated. And rebuilding itself, but there's still crime, you know. Yeah. So I think that would be. I, I don't see it going on too much further than that. I mean, I went. I, went, I studied Russian at school, and went on a. We went on a kind of rather ambitious school trip, which started in West Berlin, East Berlin, and then went by train to Leningrad and um, yeah, Leningrad and Moscow in '81, and I. Remember, we, we had a kind of day where we went through Checkpoint Charlie, went into East Berlin, and for some reason I ended up being um, interviewed by the Stasi because I was wearing a badge saying accidental death of an anarchist on it, which they didn't seem to like. But that was my that was my Checkpoint Charlie experience. But when we went through to East Berlin, it really felt like we'd gone from colour to black and white, and it felt like there'd been no reconstruction at all that there were these incredible buildings sort of caged in with bits of, um, just with a metal mesh just to stop the masonry falling out anymore. And it, it's amazing how long Berlin took to rebuild, isn't it? Well, it's a work in progress. I mean, I, I was there um, a couple of years, was it? Yeah, it was a couple of years ago because uh, we were going to go last April again because I, I just love it. Yeah. Um, and of course the pandemic kicked that into touch. But the year mm. before, um, it's still, a, you know, a work in progress. You can, um, yeah. there's a lot of new building. Yeah. Um, East Berlin's a, you know, thriving place with lots of good stuff going on there. But you turn the corner and you come across this sort of wasteland. Yes. Um, um, that is uh, still being developed, or there are gaps between buildings that are propped up on either side, and nobody's actually filled that in. And there are plenty of buildings where you turn the corner of a street and you can still see sort of bullet pop marks and shell holes yeah. and stuff up to about 12 feet high off the street. So it's uh, it's an amazing place, absolutely. Nothing quite. I don't think I. I think it's my favourite city in Europe, to be honest. Yeah, and I suppose in a way, it, it's a kind of microcosm of so much, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and I, it doesn't bury its past, and it doesn't sort of celebrate it. It has a very kind of slightly edgy, critical awareness of, of the past, which I think is a, is a very healthy thing for any city. 
but I remember the uh, first time I went to Rome, I was being, I was really struck by the fact that, you know, one of those statistics, but only 5% of Rome is sort of ab above ground. You know, there's still so much of the past to be um, excavated. But I mean, clearly, I, I'm guessing Rome uh, Rome must be somewhere in the top three in terms of influential cities for you, isn't it? Is that somewhere that you've spent a lot of time in? I have, yeah, but it, it's it's a difficult one because, I mean, there's just so much stuff. I mean, I find Italy yeah. a, a sort of a difficult place to get my head around because, you know, it is just stuffed to the gills with history. Yeah. Um, a couple of years it's ago... It's not really like, a country, is it, Italy? It's not really no, a country. No, it's, it's, it's a kind of... Reasons. Yeah, it's a kind of uh, graveyard of history in a way. And, and, mm. and I mean that because I, I went to this um, villa uh, about four years ago. I went to Venice for a literary festival. Oh, yeah. And um, we were taken to this villa for lunch and then shown around. And we went up into the loft. And there was this vast loft with bookshelves going down the wall with books decaying. Mm -hmm. And there was something like about 30,000 volumes there going back to the 15th century, just gathering dust. And I turned to our host and I said, this is incredible, you know. Yeah. And he said, Simon, in this region of Italy alone, there are something like 4,000 houses like this, you know. Wow. And, um, and I was like, <laughs> and it's like, uh, you know, there's a sort of blasé attitude to it that the Italians have, you know. Oh, yeah, it's, you know, 15th century manuscript. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, you go to Rome and there's a, uh, some guy on his moped leaning up against a priceless historical monument, you know, doing his mobile phone call. He said, get off, get off, get off. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. It's, uh, it's a bit hard coming from, you know, Britain where um, most of our history is the last thousand years in terms of what we've got left. Uh, and the rest of it is just what's left of the Roman remains and yeah. gold. I mean, Mussolini just basically built his road straight through the Forum, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, I know. Really, what was that? Just said, you know, the, the road of victory straight down the middle. Yeah. Um, so um, you you write, not surprisingly, you, you write in an incredibly visual way. And, you know, clearly it would be wonderful to sit down on a Sunday night and watch Black House as a major series on on tv um do you, do you think about that when you're writing absolutely um you know I, I it's it's i think one of the books that helped me quite a lot when i was starting out was um, stephen king's on writing oh perfect. And, yeah. Uh, yeah it's a fabulous read yeah but he has this phrase uh, which really stuck in my mind he said that uh, when he was encouraging you know people to get to writing because you know writers are lazy people and <laughs> it's forever to get going you know because we can do hoovering we can do ironing you know, all these things at home rather than sit down and write yeah and his answer to that is just to say look make yourself write whatever it is just do it get started yeah. and he said if it, and after 20 minutes or so and the phrase he uses was you begin to see through the paper now, um, I read that and I thought, yeah, that's exactly what it is. Mm. Um, after a certain time, when I start writing, I begin to kind of almost vicariously hear things, smell things, feel things, see things. And it's like there's a, a film playing out you know, on the inside of my, of my forehead. And it's just simply a question of kind of putting it down as you see it in your head. Yeah. Um, I think that's what gives it that, that uh, immersiveness that, that a lot of readers seem to respond to. Um, I mean, I, I was really, it's, it's interesting how many sort of films there have been and TV series set in Berlin. I mean, I, I, if you saw Babylon Berlin, I thought that was kind of astonishing. And that came out of a graphic novel, I think. But they're, they're, and then you go back to kind of Isherwood's Berlin as well, don't yeah. you? Um, and I think the mo I think about five years ago, the then mayor of Berlin described the city as sexy but poor and I thought that, yeah. that's, a, that's a nice kind of well, it's it's I mean it's a fabulous I mean that that kind of last days of the Weimar Republic you know mm. um when th there is this fantastically liberal intellectual city yeah. Um, yeah which is politically febrile you know there's so much going on and you know it could have gone either way you know uh, they, they could have been a, a swing to the left or, yeah, yeah. but it, as it was, it really went the other direction. And suddenly, <clears throat> one of the most civilized cities in, in the whole of Europe becomes this shrine to barbarism and intolerance. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, th there's a huge lesson uh, in there. I mean, whenever anybody says, you know, I think there was this kind of thought that we were moving in a generally progressive direction for the last, you know, two or three decades. 
Yeah. And we seem to have hit a, a brick wall now. And it seems to be very much spinning out of control in, in, in very unpleasant ways. Um, you know, people talk about you know populism and nationalism. Um, we're beginning to see it. You know, uh, it, it is it's very much part of our political culture now that people are thinking quite intolerant thoughts, quite kind of reactionary ways of doing things. Um, and, and, you know, it is a small step from that to political violence, political suppression, yeah. Yeah. dictatorship. You know, so we're always on the cusp of that. And I think that, you know, one of the things that um, that particular setting, Weimar Republic, Berlin, you know, mm. is, is there was a wonderful documentary a few years ago, something, um, you know, a warning from history. I forget what we made. That was the subtitle. Okay. But I thought, well, yes, yes, you know, that, that is kind of how it feels like. And when I'm writing, when I was writing um, Blackout, um, yeah. so much of the uh, mechanisms and strategies and the political maneuvering and and propaganda of, of the nazi party is being repeated you know in in modern societies in america and britain in in france in germany and a lot of this stuff has traction because uh you know for the vast majority of people they 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 buy into simple repeated ideas far more easily than they do into complexity um, and there's a lovely cartoon, I think I saw it in Private Eye a few months ago, where there's this long queue of people coming up to a desk and it says answers. And it says one going, simple but wrong, you know, <laughs> complex but right. And there are very few people going down that path. Um, right. And, I, you know, that is the danger of any kind of democratic system. When people think in terms of platitudes, and that becomes the, the most effective form of politics, you know, that, that, that tends towards extremes, you know. What we need is is a sort of a, a slower way of doing things uh, and being more considerate and thinking of things in more complex ways. And of course, the moment you sort of say that, then people go, mm, you know, why should I have to do that? I'd rather kind of, you know, get Brexit done and think, well, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, what have, could you think of a more vacuous political slogan than get Brexit done? And yet, you know, yeah. take back control. Well, 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 you know, that that begs 20 questions rather than answers anything. And I think, uh, you know, that that's the warning from history. And, and that's the kind of thing that I came up against again and again and again when I was writing Blackout, is this kind yeah. of reductive thinking about fairly complex issues. And then it come, there, comes, there comes a point where it, it isn't actually something that is on the menu. Any kind of reflective thinking about a complex issue that you do in public suddenly becomes a dangerous thing to do. You know, and that's Nazi Germany in spades. Yeah, I mean, there are a huge number of warnings, aren't there, from the use of propaganda in the 1930s. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just, just, to, just to move away from that for a second, I, I noticed you, you've co-authored a number of books over the years, haven't you? Yeah. And I just wondered, um, you know, clearly you think very, very deeply about everything that goes into your books. And, and I think you, you're talking about politics there. It's really, really interesting. When you're, when you're working with someone on a book... Um, how does how does that work? Because I mean, is it two people trying to drive the same car, or is one of you in the back seat, one of you in the front? How, how do you actually make it work? Um, well, it's kind of like um, I think of it as kind of the literary version of marriage, actually. <laughs> oh, um, goodness me! <laughs> if you pick the wrong partner, you are going to have nothing but rows. You know, yeah. and that's the way yeah. it goes. Um, if you pick the right partner and you, and you have that kind of lovely accident uh, where you sort of yep. overlap and everything is quite productive, yep. um, then you can go quite quite smoothly. So, you know, I've, I've uh, had co tried to co-write things with people in the past and sometimes it hasn't worked. But um, it worked well with one of my former students, Lee, when we wrote a crime novel called Playing With Death. Yeah. Which was quite well received, you know, from people who actually read it. But unfortunately, it was kind of marketed as... Oh, from the guy who writes those Roman novels. And it was a tech, you know, a tech thriller set three or four years in the future. You know, there's no overlap there. So why market no. it as if it's a kind of historical fiction with, you know, AI? Um, yeah, so yeah. it was a bit of a, a, um, a problem. And, and, you know, we, we got a lot of really good feedback, uh, including from the FBI, who, who we'd tapped for a lot of the uh, knowledge about how they would uh, operate. And the FBI contact we had said, yeah, it's great. He said, you know, it's, this is how we do things. And, you know, it's very, very realistic. But that didn't win us any kind of plot, you know, any sales because it was badly marketed. Mm. Um, I think a, a, a clever quote from the FBI would be great, though, wouldn't it? 
Yeah, well, you know, we did ask him. He said, we can't do that. That's that's part of how it works. You know, you, know, you can pick up brains, but we can't, you know, you can't yeah, name yeah. people. people. Um, but that was really interesting. So, you know, and when I worked with TJ Andrews on the, yes. you know, the Roman yes. stuff, um, we're, you know, we're at work on another one now uh, that's set in, it's very different, but it's set in the same sort of era. And um, it's really, you know, when you find someone that you can bounce an idea off, and they come back with something and they change it slightly. And then you say, well, what about if we do this? And then yeah. the whole thing kind of has this virtuous um, dialectic of, you know, building up and getting better and better and better. Um, and um, it's really exciting. Um, I'm not sure I could do it all the time. I, I, I like it as a, as a different way of writing um, because, it, you know, it's like so many things. I mean, you, you know, you know, the publishing world, um, everybody kind of thinks that, Everything begins and ends with the writer. It doesn't. You know, there are editors, there are proof yeah. editors, copy editors, there's the marketing team, there's your you know, your agent, there's your you know, your wife who reads through the uh, the, the first draft and so on and suggests mm. things. So it is very and then of course, you know, this is only half the equation, because I mean, you know, you take that, you open it up, what do you got? Black marks on white paper. Fifty percent of the work is done by the reader. You know, yeah, they have to yeah, take yeah. those black marks and then reconstruct from that, you know, the vision that you're trying to, con Ooh, to communicate yeah. to them. So I love that. You know, yeah. the version that I've created in my head is going to be different to, to the version that every other reader, you know, um, generates from that book. And that, of course, is why books are so much better than films. Films are a tyranny of vision. It is the director's vision of how, you know, to tell a particular story. There's no alternative. You know, yeah. every person that picks up yeah. a book creates a unique experience and that's the beauty yeah. of reading um and and the fun of writing and i think you know uh, that, that you know reading is about one of the most creative things that a person can do i think because you know you you're, mm -hmm. you're doing all the image work you know when yeah. you turn those marks into into pictures in your head you know so i think uh, the idea that you know it begins and ends with the author is is a complete myth you know there's so yeah. much involved there's so many different people involved and sometimes if you're co-writing that's just another aspect of that it isn't a different way of doing things it's just um you know a slight variation on what you do anyway and if well, you work with someone... i mean i was going to say like you know you talked about marriage i mean i suppose that the best writing partnership the way you're you know the two plus two equals sort of six scenario isn't it that you're bringing yeah, absolutely. some yeah. extra magic but when when you work when you work with um TJ on on a new series. I mean, are you? Do you plot very very carefully in a way that you maybe don't do on your own? You kind of go off on a journey yeah. when you're on your own. Yeah, I mean that that's that, that, yeah, you're right. It's exactly how it is. Uh, when we sit down, um, Tim and I would just we kind of go through it, you know, it's almost down to yeah. kind of scene by scene level. So, for example, the, the latest project that we're working on with the the first synopsis is about ten pages long. Mm. Um, when I'm writing a Macro and Cato novel, um, the synopsis is half a page because okay. I know where it's going to be set. I know what, what the kind of problem they're going to have to resolve is. I know who the villain will be. But everything beyond that, you know, the story unfolds yep. I'm telling it. Um, and I like to do it that way because, you know, there's a huge degree of uncertainty and every book is a kind of voyage of discovery. Yep. Um, and, it, and it keeps it fresh. And it makes, you know, and I want to know what the ending is, even if I don't actually know what it's going to be. Uh, when I start writing the book, um, so it's a very different way of doing things. Uh, when we we talked to Sophie Hanna about um, not just her own books, but about writing the Poirot continuation books, and um, she said she sort of plots, and then the characters do what she tells them to do, and you know, mm. in that room, out that room, and and move on. Whereas I think other people we spoke to just said they spend a lot of time on almost hot seating their characters so they know everything about them and then they put them in a situation and then the character explains to them where the book's going to go and um i'm just i'm just thinking with uh with uh with capo macro you know them so well now are they are they kind of waking you up in the morning and saying we're going on an adventure come with us get your bring your pen it'll be useful well yeah i mean basically i'm an amanuensis you know yeah um I sit down in front of the word processor, they start talking, they say stuff I don't anticipate. You know, yeah. they may take me somewhere I don't intend to go. Oh. Um, and I, that's exciting. You know, I, I like to find that stuff out along with the reader. 
Um, you know, if I sort of planned it all out meticulously, my worry is that it would come across as slightly dry. And I think you yeah. know, the longevity of the series is down entirely to the credibility of the characters rather than any particular story. Um, when you're writing a long series like that, do you ever get to a stage where you think, oh, I wish I'd turned left rather than right nine books ago because it would enable, enable me to do this? Or are you, uh, you never look uh, back as a writer, you keep going? Well, I, I think, you know, it's like life, isn't it? You know, if you spend your time fixated on the road you didn't take, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. then you're not making most of the one you're on. So um, I try not to think that way because, um, you know, it's, it's a dead end. It doesn't achieve anything. You know, it's a waste of effort, really. Mm. Um, I should know the answer to this, but have you, have you written non-fiction as well? Or have you you've only... Yeah, well, <laughs> I've written a very, very dry thesis on the Vietnam War when I was uh, yeah. at university. But, uh, and the, after that was over, I thought, that's it, I'm done with academia because uh, oh, it was just such a ghastly experience. And, um, uh, and having to write something you know, that eight people would ever read, uh, yeah. you know, it's a bit dispiriting. So, um, but I, you know, I, I will do, um, I'm trying to, I write a, a, you know, part of this process that uh, uh, Stephen King recommends about writing stuff down. You know, it's a lot of stuff it is, uh, if something's, a, you know, a film I've seen, I'll write a review. If it's a book I've seen, I'll write a review. Uh, yeah. A book yeah. I've read that, you know, has impressed me in any particular way, I'll write down why, you know, it impresses me and I'll put, post it on my Facebook page and people can agree or disagree as they see fit. And equally with politics, you know, quite a lot of the time something will happen, you think, well, that's interesting. And what are the yeah. implications yeah. for that? So I'll put that down there. Um, I, you know, I, I mean, I, I've tried to write a few kind of slightly longer articles, but, um, I, you know, and, and you think, well, this is, this is as good as anything else I'm reading in the New Statesman. So why yeah. on earth isn't, isn't this sort of thing being published? And I think there's a tendency to, uh, if you write popular fiction, um, there's a tendency within a certain uh, echelon of the literary world to think that, well, then you're pretty dumb, aren't you? And you don't yeah, have anything. Well, to totally agree. agree. Totally agree. Yeah. yeah. And you think, well, actually, you know, I write this stuff because I, I do feel passionate about it. I'm interested in it, but that doesn't stop me being, you know, interested in other stuffs. And it doesn't make me necessarily an idiot. Um, and I think that kind of casual dismissal of anybody who writes popular fiction um, is, is entirely <laughs> mistaken from most yeah. of the people. I know. Well, particularly when we have a classicist in number ten, don't we? But you know, let's... Uh, yeah, a classicist keeps getting it wrong. I, I, you know, I, was, I nearly shouted at an interview he did when he was going on about oh, blah, 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 the uh, the Roman calends, you know, uh, the Greek calends or something like that. I can't I thought, no, you got it wrong. It's the other culture entirely. But nobody calls him out on this stuff, and I think it's because. You know, the lack of classical education in society is, is such that Boris can bluff us, even on classics. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so, oh, you're back, Sam. Nice I to see you. In. Um, so I was just going to say there's a there's a question from the, the rather brilliantly named Maxi Maxi saying, would you ever be tempted to set a book in the future? Well, I mean, you have, haven't you? And you've talked mm -hmm. about that. But what about far into the future? Is that something that... Um, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I'd love at some point to, to write the dystopian science fiction novel, you know, um, uh, because that, that was a lot of my um, popular culture when I was growing up. And mm. films like Blade Runner, I mean, I'm a huge fan of Philip K. Dick, um, as, as it would seem, is, is a lot of, you know, the, the, the uh, production people in, in, in Hollywood. I mean, the amount of yeah. films that that guy's generated. Incredible, yeah. So, um, and I love and I love his stuff, and I love that kind of weird vertigo he does, where you kind of think you understand what this is all about. And then he kind of whips the rug away, and you think, "Oh, it's like that!" And, you know, I got it all wrong. And he keeps doing that to you all the way through a novel. I think it's genius. And I'd love to be able to write something, you know, um, science fiction. Uh, I've, I've had a, a not plot for a novel that uh, it's been with me for about twenty or thirty years now, and um, I will sit down and write it at some stage, but. Uh, yeah, it's very much in that kind of Philip K. Dick mould, but I'll, I'll have to wait until I find the time to get that one done. Um, I do you... the, um, the... Go on. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, I love the elasticity of your imagination, that you're not limited to any particular field or space, but it's just, <laughs> just, it's all story, isn't it? All story and character. Absolutely. Story and character. That That is, you know, that's 99% of what it's all about. You know, everything else is, is merely detail. If you can, you, if you write a... Um, you know the thing—the thing that people 
uh, love, that what I like to read about, and I guess what a lot of people like to read about, it's the people. You know, it's about human interest. We, we're interested in other people. We're interested in how they react. We're interested in how they respond. We're interested in that, you know, what we, how far we empathize with a certain point of view. All of that's been known to dramatists and, and writers, you know, right from the outset. I mean, it's there in, um, you know, Terentius. It's there in Shakespeare all the way through. Um, that's what we're interested in, people. You know, we're the biggest Absolutely. puzzle there is. Yeah, <laughs> sure. And do you spend a lot of time working on getting those characters right before you start a book? Because if you're taking characters through a whole series, like mm. the horse is your new guy, isn't it? Horse Schenker, is it? Yeah. Um, in Blackout. Have you spent a lot of time getting into his head and finding out what his his story is? No, no. And um, that's a very, very deliberate strategy because um, I've, I've noticed a lot of people, you know, some people on the review say, oh, you know, um, they talk about... Uh, um, Philip Kerr's books, which I haven't read very deliberately because I didn't want that to influence the writing. I'm very much aware of them. And, and I, I, you know, I understand that he does it from a kind of uh, Raymond Chandler-esque version of, you know, first person in Nazi Germany, and it's a bit funny and, you know, dry humour and all that sort of stuff. And, and it occurred to me that, you know, humour is the very last thing you would try in Nazi Germany. You know, people get, you know, executed for telling jokes against about the Fuhrer and being a bit, you know, slapdash with the humour. So um, my feeling about Horschenko was, you know, I, I started writing it. And I thought, well, I don't know this guy. And um, I'm going to get to know him during the course of the book. So it was very much a case of, you know, the situation, character, uh, and seeing how he responds to it, and then get to learn a bit about him. And then the reader via me gets to learn a bit about him. And if I'd sort of planned him out too, too thoroughly, I think um, part of the, the, the um, interest in the character for me is going to die if I actually know everything about him right from the start. You know, I want to, like the reader, you know, kind of get to know him over the course of, of this. And he will occasionally surprise us, and that's, that, that's good. If I knew everything about him, there wouldn't be any surprises. I love that. I love that you can trust the process, that you know he's going to reveal himself. And I think that's that's experience that comes through writing this incredible um, catalogue of books, isn't it? Um, yeah, it's fascinating. And there was, um, there, there was a question about the challenges of putting real historical figures into your fiction. I just wondered, you know, if, if Hitler walks into a page of the book, there's quite a lot of baggage there, to say the least, isn't there? It's difficult. Yeah, to I, there, there is. And I think, um, I mean, you know, there's some lovely stuff that's come out recently of um, recordings of Hitler in an informal context. His voice is very different. You know, he's mm. very kind of you know, folksy and... Uh, it could be your gentle old uncle, you know, talking about, you know, how, how things are going with the puppies, you know. It was that kind of yeah. thing. So um, if if someone, a character like that is going to make an appearance, um, I think it, you, you, you should try and latch onto something that people, you know, will not be expecting. Yeah. That is a genuine aspect of that person's character. Also, for example, I mean, he could fart like a trooper because apparently, you know, thanks to his vegetarian diet, he was constantly <laughs> sort of blowing off. And in a very kind of smelly way. Now, you know, I don't see that in very many, you know, representations of Hitler. And that'd be great. To yeah, have you heard it here first. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's fascinating. It's, it's brilliant how you how you get into the story, how you have this incredibly um, tense, dramatic story. And yet the, and the characters are revealing themselves as you go along through the process. Do you find you have a lot of editing to do at the end? Do you do a lot of redrafting before you submit? Or is it... Does it fall into place pretty well at this stage? Um, Again, you're working less, for a period, of position of experience too, which does help. Well, less so with Macro and Cato, um, because I know them so well. And, um, you know, that is a fairly kind of uh, fluid thing when, when I sit down to write that. And, and the editing doesn't take a huge amount of time because there's not much that changes. Because, I, you know, I, I kind of, you know, get Macro yeah. and Cato. Um, and it's really the only thing that you have to change is uh, the nuts and bolts of the plot. Because... Um, Sometimes something will come up and you think two thirds of the way through, well, no, no, that, that explains why they did that earlier. But now that's inconsistent. So I have to go back and, you know, tinker with that. But with something like, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the Schenker novel, that, that, uh, to, because it's a, you're working your way into a new genre. You're working your way into a, a new setting, a new character, um, a new way of writing in, in some respects. So you need to, um, Spend a little time, more time at the end of that, going over it to just refine it, tinker it, you know, get it, get it to sort of thing. I'm sure in you know four or five books' time, um, assuming we get that far, um, 
Schenker will, will I will know him sufficiently well, and the peripheral counter characters and Berlin, that um, that that editing process will be a little bit shorter. I hope so because I've got lots of other projects. You know, I'd like to get going Brilliant. as well. I love I love the all, all so many ideas. You can feel I'm bouncing off the walls in your study. It's great. Yeah, well, it's like you know, I could write my my rain my red deer book as well. Absolutely, so, it's very important. Yeah. Make sure you get your deer mentioned too. Um, it's one o'clock. Our hour has wow. flown Can't past. Uh, it's been absolutely fascinating. Um, I think I've yeah, there's the, there's the proof of the very snazzy proof copy. I've popped yeah. the link into the comments. Um, <laughs> the book. There you go. That's it. Perfect. Look at the two different covers. Lovely. Uh, the link is in the comments, guys. So do make sure you buy this. In terms of you need to find out about character, you need to find out about plot. Um, so much wonderful stuff in here, and it's been just so fascinating. Yeah, thank um, you so much. Simon. Yeah, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, no, so that's it. Link link in the comments it's been lovely to have you and um we look forward hopefully to, to getting some feedback and some reviews and some of the guys watching uh, reading the book well, well thank you for the, the invite i've had a great time talking to yeah, you so it's, it's really it's enjoyable been... thank you so Brilliant. much so thank you and thank you guys for joining us from all over the world nova scotia from uh, york and all parts of the uk thank you so much Brilliant. look forward to seeing you all soon okay <laughs>